On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including Elon gives a new timeline for Starship Orbital Launch, a new update on the Starlab commercial space station project, and Impulse Space is developing an orbital taxi for small payloads. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. After everything slowed down over the holidays, we are starting to see activity pick up again all across the space race, and that includes at SpaceX's testing facility in Boca Chica, Texas. Just after the November 29th static fire test of Booster 7, SpaceX had to close down their testing area around the orbital launch mount due to some worrying damage in the concrete pad that held up the entire structure. As you can probably imagine, there is no magic concrete that can withstand the force of 11 Raptor 2 engines, or even the repeated smaller scale testing that led up to that event. So there have been some repairs and changes made to the testing site. One of the most noticeable changes has been an upgrade to the berm that separates the launch apparatus from the tank farm. This dense structure made of compacted dirt and concrete is what protects the tank farm from the effects and debris generated by those static fire tests. It looks like the berm has been reinforced with extra concrete and is taller than it was previously. The engineers appear to still be working on routing drainage troughs and other general plumbing through that area, but it looks like it's almost complete. There's also been some repairs made under and around the orbital launch mount. Just before the November 29th static fire, SpaceX had made some changes to the concrete used under the launch mount, ripping up the older stuff and replacing it with a fast curing and extremely heat resistant concrete called Fondag. But even though this concrete can take temperatures of more than 1100 degrees Celsius, the test still left pockmarks in the fresh concrete pad afterwards. So they've been rebuilding at least parts of the concrete pad with some stronger stuff, as well as replacing some of the orbital mounts plumbing for some potentially sturdier versions. But that will likely also require replacing at some point. That's just the nature of the beast. If you look at the beating NASA's infrastructure took after the SLS launch, you'll see more examples of how difficult it is to build something that can take the sorts of force that these new rockets can dish out. These super heavy rockets are pushing the limits of what our infrastructure can take. And speaking of pushing launch gear to the limit, SpaceX is also taking this time to test their orbital launch mount to see if it can take the weight of a fully loaded Starship. Normally, this sort of testing would have been done a while ago, but SpaceX knowing that they weren't going to have to test a fully fueled and stacked vehicle anytime soon, decided to just push forward with testing. They were always going to have to pause for a bit before trying a fully fueled Starship stack. It's just convenient the Booster 7 test fire exposed damage that required a pause in OLM testing anyhow, so it all worked out in the end. But it's the rig SpaceX has created for this test that's catching some attention. From an excellent and well-researched investigation by Zach Golden and 3D artist Ryan Hansen, this model and animation was created, and it shows how the rig is likely intended to work, pulling on each of the 10 pairs of hold-down clamps at various force ratings controlled by testers. The hold-down clamps both secure the Starship rocket and take the whole vehicle's weight before launch. So, the engineers need to know if these clamps can actually take the full 4,536 metric tons of weight that a fully fueled Starship will have. So, using this new rig, it seems SpaceX technicians can test each axis of the OLM for up to 250 metric tons of force, which is about 110% of their expected load to allow for an additional safety factor just in case. The rig seems to work by leveraging the weight from a counterweight station that the team set up under the OLM. The whole rig looks like it will allow technicians to not just test the weights required, but closely monitor them. Very slick stuff. Aside from the OLM being tested, the SpaceX team has also had the time to cryoproof Booster 9, cycling cryogenic fuel into the booster to test its resistance to the shock. And, as expected, work on more Starship vehicles hasn't stopped either. 
while Ship 24 had a small static fire test on December 15th while it was parked on suborbital pad B, Starship 25 and 26 were spotted in the bay together, and pieces of Starship 28 were seen as well. From the shots we're getting, it really looks like the production of these vehicles has gotten much smoother as the team gets more practiced and infrastructure gets completed. All of this comes as Elon Musk gives yet another update to the orbital launch timeline, and according to the SpaceX CEO, we are going to see at least another two or three months of testing before anything big happens. Elon tweeted on January 7th, We have a real shot at late February. March launch attempts appear highly likely. Now, keeping in mind that this is the same dude that originally claimed this thing would launch in the summer of 2021. So, as with all Elon timelines, big pinch of salt. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep up the hope. International aerospace giant Airbus has reportedly signed on to Voyager Space's Starlab space station. On January 4th, Voyager Space announced the new partnership saying that Airbus will be providing technical design support and expertise for the new commercial station, which was originally announced back in October of 2021. The project, which includes partners like Lockheed Martin and NanoRacks, a subsidiary of Voyager, intends on creating one of the first commercial space stations in order to help transition NASA and other international agencies away from the aging International Space Station. Airbus brings to the table not only technical expertise and experience, but a chance to cater to a whole new market. Dylan Taylor, CEO of Voyager Space, explains, saying, Working with Airbus, we will expand Starlab's ecosystem to serve the European Space Agency, ESA, and its member state space agencies to continue their microgravity research in LEO. Any upcoming commercial space stations will sink or swim depending on their ability to host government agencies. With Lockheed Martin and Voyager Space, the Starlab is already an appealing new base for NASA, once the ISS finally shuts down sometime around 2030. But while Airbus brings European accessibility to the commercial station, Nicholas Maubert, space counselor at the French embassy in the US, says there's no guarantee that Europeans will be comfortable spending tax dollars on a project that is mostly American-owned. He goes on to say that the European leaders might be more inclined to agree to this arrangement if more European companies and ISS partners become involved with the Starlab project. After the ISS closes down, Anyone who wants to access low Earth orbit is going to have to make deals with commercial stations or the Chinese, at least until international governments band together to make another publicly owned station. But this is a new age of space operations, and it makes sense that there will be some pause over the many new ways of doing things. Collaborations like Starlab signing on Airbus will make things easier to swallow, but whether or not certain countries are comfortable is not really up to the Starlab project's partners. If countries want their tax dollars going to space infrastructure that they own, they're going to have to make their own stations or play ball with the projects that are already in development. German Space Agency Director Peter Groff puts it best, saying, We need to find ways to work together, certainly in other ways than we did before. Impulse Space, the company founded by legendary rocket engine designer and former SpaceX executive Tom Mueller, has announced that their orbital transfer vehicle, the Mira, will be getting its first mission later this year. The LEO Express 1 mission will be launched aboard SpaceX's Transporter 9 rideshare mission, which is scheduled for the fourth quarter of 2023. Whenever we launch a rocket to place satellites in orbit, we have to carefully plot that rocket's trajectory to at least roughly match up with the intended orbits of the satellites it's carrying. This is because the average rocket's upper stage doesn't have much fuel left for maneuvering, and most satellite payloads don't have enough capacity to store the fuel they need to get into their orbits on their own. This is what transfer vehicles are for. Typically, these are small vehicles fitted to a rocket's upper stage that are purpose-built to use efficient fuels and thrusters, allowing them to put smaller CubeSats and other payloads into the correct orbit, sort of like a payload taxi. This lends missions a lot of extra flexibility because the transfer vehicle broadens the mission area and relaxes the requirements of the rocket somewhat, which is probably why the market for in-space transportation vehicles is heating up. 
Companies like Deorbit, Momentus, and Launcher all flew their own transfer vehicles recently. As Impulse COO Barry Matsumori, another SpaceX alumna, puts it, the market is developing at about the same pace as the in-space transportation capabilities are developing. In the last three months, we've seen many more customers than we did in the prior six months. What puts Impulse Space's Mira ahead of the pack, though, is its performance. According to the company, the vehicle has been extensively tested, and with a payload of about 300 kilograms, Mira reportedly has over 1,000 meters per second of delta V, which is the ability to change velocity. Matsumori chimes back in with some context, saying, Most everyone out there has a fairly low delta V for the mass they are carrying. We are pretty much on the high end of the capabilities of the vehicles. Impulse says that Mira is the first in a fleet of vehicles that the company wants to develop, adding to their ability to facilitate orbital insertion at distances all the way out to geostationary. The vision is to have a system similar to earthbound transport, with capabilities ranging from a figurative space pickup truck to a space 18-wheeler. As for the rest of this year, however, Impulse already has a full docket with both the Mira launch and their work with Relativity Space on that company's Terran R Mars lander, the first commercial Mars mission, which will be launching in 2024. Like Matsumori said, space infrastructure is really going to be where money is made in the new space race. Over the next few years, we'll likely see a huge variety of new takes on this field, and when the dust settles, we'll end up with a solid space transportation system spanning from Earth all the way to Mars. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.